Good morning, church. Um, so I got actually two testimonies. I'll try to make them quick. Um, the first testimony is something that I've been praying about. Um, I had left my job a while back, as many of you guys have known, um, and pursued what I love to do, and that's working with children. Um, when I left my job, I took a huge pay cut, um, but I knew that this was the will of God. It was something I prayed about. I believed in that he was going to provide for me because he's always provided for me. Um, still faithful tithing. Um, so anyways, when I took this position, the position was in New Bedford, which was really tough because it's a lot of miles on my car. It's the gas, um, wear and tear. But I just kept on believing that God was going to make that happen. Um, so I ended up finding out through somebody else that there was actually opening in Somerset, which is like four minutes from my house. It's right there. And, um, but the problem was is they love me here. They, really, they do. It's a tough, tough room. Um, I've been told over and over again how much patience I have with the kids. Um, the majority of my ki the kids that are in that class are either ha are involved with DSS or they're foster kids. So it's very, very difficult room, but I love them. Um, so I kept praying about it. When I found out, I was like, I don't know if I should say something or I should just wait. So I kept praying about it. Well, the next day, the centers were all closed. We had to do training. And I go sit at a table. Uh, didn't even know what, if I was at the right table, and I just sat down. And I overhear people asking, am I at the right table? So I come to find out that I was at the right table. The woman had a paper. She's like, oh, you're, you're actually at the table you're supposed to be. Not only do I sit at the right table, but I find out that the people I'm sitting with are from Somerset. The director was sitting right next to me, uh, the one who does hiring for there. <laughs> so I start talking to her, and uh, we hit it off really good, and I tell her I want to go to Somerset. I said, you know, I had overheard there's an opening in Somerset. She's like, there is, but she's like, they might not let you go. And I'm like, oh, no, they're going to because I'm going to pray. <laughs> and I had uh, talked to Pastor and Linda about it. We started praying about it. And the, so I'm like, I'm, gonna, I'm going to say something. But I was afraid that if I did, they were going to lie about it and say, oh, no, there's no opening. So that night, I go home. I go on Indeed. What do you know? There's an ad for it. So now I have it black and white. Monday comes around. My director is on vacation. Now, I know if I asked my director, I really believe she was going to lie to me because they have a really difficult time in that room to hire people. Again, we still continue to pray for it. Um, so I'm like, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to go to the owner. So I went to the owner, and she tells me, no, that you're mistaken. There is no opening. I'm like, there is an opening, and I'm going to go to Somerset, and I kept praying about it. So long story short, the later on that week, she sees me. She sees me with the children. The kids were out of control that day. So she could see my face. Um, and I, so I think she started realizing, like, uh-oh, like, I'm going to lose this girl. Um, and she, so when I came into the room, my room was cr crazy. I get called in the office. So I'm like, okay. So I go in. She sits me down, and she's like, listen. She's like, I have to apologize. She's like, I was actually wrong. There is an opening in Somerset. She's like, the director here does not want to lose you. I can, I can either give you a dollar raise to stay here, or you can go to Somerset. And I'm like, no, I want Somerset. And uh, so thank God. She just asked me to be patient for two weeks, but I will be able to go to Somerset. And that's, a, and that's so good for me because the center is right here. So by the time I leave here, it's like something's like after 5 o'clock, I have to go back to Fall River be my children, and then come back here. And it's, it's a lot. I mean, on average, I'm putting like over 200 miles on my vehicle. Um, so that's one testimony. The next testimony, um, again, it's a miracle that I'm able to tithe every single week. Um, Pastor, I preached about that on Wednesday. And that's, no matter what, I've always been faithful because God does provide. And he's proved that this week. <laughs> um, so... My kids need a school shopping. We need to go take, uh, go f buy them stuff. I'm like, my kids are like, Hot mom, how are we gonna do it? I'm like, it's all right, I'll provide. Well, their father and I are not together, but you know, with as much as it's been her and all that, he has been very good about that. And he provided the children for what they needed, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, but my daughter, who's attending Liberty, called me the other day and she's crying. Mom, I just need, I just need you to pray with me, and uh, and she was just really just 
just stressed out. Um, she had worked over the summer. There was She ran into some financial situations she was expecting. And she's like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, no, we're going to pray because God always provides. Her computer had broke. It was like $400. I don't know how I'm going to get this money, Mom. And I was like, I'm going to send you my computer. I don't need it. It was for my old job. I shipped it out to her, so I took care of that financial burden. Um, but I was like, you know, God, I was like, I have some unexpected bills of my own that came up. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm, I know you're going to provide. <laughs> oh, God. Um, so that day I come home, and there's a check from Liberty University. Now, for the school, what they do is the, I owe a lot of money for her schooling, but that's okay because God's going to take care of it. Um, they came, they, they disperse the money for the school, and then I have to pay for that loan later on when she graduates. Well, they end up dispersing me back $6,000. <laughs> so that was able to pay, pay, help some with Carolyn's loan and a couple of bills that I was not expecting. So I am telling you, I know Pastor preached about this on Wednesday, but I am telling you, if you are a faithful tither, he will provide financially, spiritually, emotionally, any possible way that you need, he will provide for you. I'm telling you, like I look at my groceries, I open up my refrigerator, I look in there and I'm like, I don't know why I still have food left. I really don't. I'll go shopping. And I mean, I am, we're a family of five and I, my gr grocery bill, $80 a week. And that $80 a week feeds me and my family. And it's amazing because God has totally rearranged my thinking about money and finance and, and he will provide, you know, I mean, not, we can't always have steak. We have hamburger helper. I mean, it doesn't matter if I have peanut butter and jelly for a meal. I don't care because the thing of it is, is no matter what that first, that, that one tenth is not my money as God's. Wow. Woo. Glory. Hallelujah. Are we on Facebook yet? Did you get that testimony on Facebook? Praise the Lord. I hope whoever's watching this morning, that you realize that in giving back what belongs to God, don't belong to you and I, belongs to Him. The tithe is holy. It's separate. It belongs to Him. And when we give Him, you know, really, we're not really giving it to Him. It belongs to Him. He gives us the other nine-tenths. He lets us keep it. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. So I'm so glad. That's a great testimony. That's an encouragement to me that, to know that when we, we stand on God's word, that God has always been faithful. Amen? Well, praise God. We want to just give enough time for uh, Pastor Jim. We want to welcome him. For his glory, Christian Assembly wants to welcome him as our guest speaker this morning. I met... Uh, Brother Jim in, uh, in Israel. Uh, I had lost my, uh, well, I didn't lose my luggage. They kept my luggage in security because I, dumb, dumb me, locked it. And he lost his luggage. And we both got it back about the same time, the, at the, a day before we left. Isn't that wonderful? And so we had no clothes, we had nothing. But this brother, I didn't even have socks. And this brother gave me a pair of his socks extra that he had. And so we just hit it off and and uh, he ended up meeting Brother Diamond, and he's just crazy like Brother Diamond is, and not as crazy, but, but uh, uh, we hit it off really well. And, and uh, he was up coaching, uh, you know, and uh, he's the chaplain for the football team of, of his town, and they were playing a football team up here, and he allowed me to go on the sidelines with him and, and watch the game. It was really phenomenal. It was a great experience. And uh, I just want to give him a good God bless welcome this morning for Reverend James Saunders. Come on, brother. <laughs> Good job, Jen. That was awesome testimony. Can I be real? Uh, I was sitting there during worship, and, and let's give the worship team another hand. I'm telling you, awesome job. Awesome job. And, and, and 
and the Lord started dealing with me like only God can. He's just dealing with me, and, and I know what I'm doing. And God said, no, you need, am I doing something wrong? The what? Pastor Bob put this on me. I just want you to know that. You have a gun in there or something? The worship team did an awesome job. Is that better? Or am I still messed up? Let me have the handheld. That's okay. I'll take it off. I hope this isn't on tape. My wife watches this. She's going to say, I told you. Oh, now he's caught in his chain. Anyway, I don't even know what I want to say. But God was dealing with me about what to share and what to say. But this is as clear as could be. But I turned around once and I looked and I saw empty chairs. Put your hand on an empty chair. Just put your hand on an empty chair. Because listen to me carefully. That chair needs to be filled. How many believe there are lost people in this area? How many have lost family members? Okay. These chairs need to be filled. And let me tell you, there's no sign outside that recognizes this church. There's no entrance coming in to recognize this church. Do you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to be the sign. He wants you to be able to encourage the people to come in. You know, John chapter 4, the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well. You know, Samaritans were half-breeds. They were people that Jewish people weren't even supposed to be around. But the woman at the well meant Jesus. And I love what the Bible says. She left her water pot there, and she went back into the city, and she told the people, you have to come see this man who knows all about me. And the Bible says the city people came out to see Jesus. And Jesus ministered to them, and many found the Lord. You are that woman at the well. You are the person that needs to go out and to share. And I want to say this to you as real as can be. And I don't make this stuff up. If worship was bad, I probably would have got up and said nothing about how good the worship was. I mean, I, I wouldn't have said the worship was terrible, but I, would, but I wouldn't have said anything. But I can tell you, the worship was phenomenal. And I looked up there, and I saw something that was so beautiful. I saw five ladies worshiping God. Every one of them, they didn't look at you. Now, Anna was the one doing this, <laughs> you know. But they were worshiping God. So when you bring somebody, don't think you have to explain to them before they come what's going to happen. Because the presence of God was in here, and I can promise you, God will explain to them. And the songs we sang today, if I was somebody hurting, if I was somebody that didn't know anything about Jesus Christ, and I was going through a tough time, and there are a lot of people in this world today going through a tough time, I can promise you I would have walked in here, and they started singing Clint Brown's first song, it administered to me. And then when they went on to the next song about the, the wall, going around the walls, and that's probably one of the most popular songs in churches that I go to today. Every, that song sung. And then the Waymaker. And then, then we ended up with, you know, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power. And I thought, oh. I started getting goosebumps and thinking, if somebody was here that was going through a tough time, God would have ministered to them right there during worship. And then you have a fortunate blessing. You have a pastor and his wife that not only loves you, but preaches the uncompromising word of God. The uncompromising word of God. They teach you about the things that need to be taught. And that's so important. That's so important. How many believe there are lost people, as I said earlier? You know, God, I love lost people. I love lost people because I was lost. But now I'm found. You see, you have the same testimony as I do. Did you know that? Yeah, you do. You have the same testimony. It's in a song we sing. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. We all have that same time. How many were lost once? How many are found now? The greatest thing in the world to know Jesus Christ. You know, some years ago, my wife and I knew that our kids were going to be getting married, and, 
and and not we weren't gonna be able to spend time with them like we used to and go you go places together so we decided in may we would go to the beach we have a friend who owns a condo in new smyrna beach and he always lets me use it when i want to so we said kids you want to go to new smyrna beach yeah you want to go in may yeah you know why may nobody's there in may nobody's at the beach so we go to the beach i, I have two children jason and jamie and we go to the beach and jamie says dad let's go to the boardwalk i love the boardwalk so we go to the boardwalk you know what i really liked about the boardwalk it was free parking. It's never free parking at the board, but it was May. It was May. So we go to the boardwalk. We get out, and I hear my daughter. I park my car. I hear my daughter say, Dad, Dad, can we ride it? Ride it. Ride what? And I looked, and up on the boardwalk, there was this giant swing. Goes up 260 feet in the air, and then just drops you. How many has ever seen it? You know what I'm talking about, the music park? Well, I, I need your help. Young man, come here. I need your help. Come here. come here, honey. I need your help. Come here. Come here. Come here. I need your help. I want to tell you, I believe everything that happens to us in life, God has a lesson for us, okay? Come here, come here. You on this side, you on this side, okay? Aren't you glad you came to church today? Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yes, I'm very happy, okay? Okay. This is Jason, and this is Jamie. What's your name? Ariana. This is Jason, and this is Jamie. What's your name? Ariana. This is Jason, this is Jamie. What's your name? Jamie. What's your name? Mm -hmm. Huh? Whoa, wait, wait. This is Jason. This is Jason. This is Jamie. What's your name? Jamie. Jamie. What's your name? Jason. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah. These are where my kids were. So we go. First of all, I did not want to ride that thing. And I said, I bet there's a weight limit. And I started praying, church. God, let there be a weight limit. I walked up to that little window. I looked inside that lady. I said, ma'am, is there a weight limit? No. My prayer wasn't answered. And then I saw on the sign, one person riding it, $25 a person. Two people riding it. Uh, $20 a person, three people riding at $15 a person. My son, Jason, did something he's never done in his life. He said, Dad, if you ride, I'll pay for it. My son never paid for anything, <laughs> for anything. And then I said, okay, I'll ride it. And he put out the money. And all of a sudden, they put us in this harness. I felt like Mr. Ed the horse. They have us in this harness. Put your arm in there. They lock us up like this. And my daughter's saying, Dad, isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? I said, nothing. And my son said, Dad, you okay? You okay? I said, nothing. And then all of a sudden, it drops you and it starts taking you up in the air. I said, nothing. Now, I want to say something, to be honest with you. Other than the Lord Jesus Christ, I've been a hero of my kids for years. For years. Jason and Jamie. Jamie's going, Dad, isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? I said, nothing. Jason said, Dad, are you okay? I said, nothing. Halfway up, Jamie says, Dad, look at Mom down there. I looked, I didn't see mom, I saw ants down there. I mean, there, there wasn't any mom down there. So all of a sudden, we get up to the top, and they said, listen, we are going to count 10, 9, 8, and at the sound, you pull the cord. Jamie was supposed to reach up with her right hand and pull the cord. I'm up there. I said, Dad, you okay? Jamie, isn't this funny? I said, nothing. All I could see looking down there, all of a sudden, they started counting. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. She reached up. She pulled the cord, and we started down. Their hero, me, here's what I did. Ah! And it goes down all the way. It starts up. You think it was scary going down, going backwards. Ah! And then it stopped. And when it stopped, there we are. And a little guy about this high walks up. He goes, there's nobody in line. Would you like to go again? I did the most Christian thing I could do. Would you like to be punched in the nose, buddy? <laughs> you know, we get off. We get off. Thank you, guys. We get off, and I did what every man in this place would do. I started walking toward my wife. And then here's what she said, Pastor. She said, honey, honey, I wish you'd have been here. I wish you'd have watched the people when they stopped when they heard you scream. <laughs> I had no idea why that happened to me. But then we go to the beach, New Suburban Beach. The next couple days, I'm on the beach, and I'm looking for a volleyball game somewhere, walking around. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, you think you screamed? He said, there's going to be three major screams someday. Three major screams. The first scream is going to be the scream when we get to heaven and we see Jesus face to face. We're going to scream with joy when we look at him face to face. The second major scream is going to be when we see our loved ones that are in heaven. When I see my mother, when I see my grandmother, when I see some beautiful people that have, that, that have died, that I've known, when we see them. But the Holy Spirit told me the third major scream 
will be the scream of those who miss heaven and those people to go to a place called hell. When they realize it's too late. It's too late. They should have listened to that pastor. They should have listened to that grandma. They should have listened to that mom. They should have listened to that dad. Three major screens. But I believe personally that every person we need to reach out to to let them find Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. We have family members. We have neighbors. We have kids we go to school with. We have people we work with. They need Jesus Christ. They need to be in a church like this where they can hear the uncompromising word of God, where they can come into the presence of God and feel the anointing of God upon their lives. I was back here this morning when I came to a pastor praying, and I prayed for three things to happen this morning. I prayed, number one, that God would be glorified. I prayed, number two, the church would be edified. And I prayed, number three, that the devil be terrified, you know, that the devil would be so scared of what's going to happen and how God's going to reach out and minister. And I believe he was during the worship. You know, I believe God was up in heaven today just tapping his foot. And then as it got even more exciting, he tapped a little louder and some of your walls started coming down. So some of the walls that you walked in here today, you, you got to believe that they're going to come down. I, I really felt the Lord tell me to share a little bit of my testimony, not to lift me up, but to lift him up. Talk about his grace and his God. I love testimonies. I love people. I'm preaching the word to you today, and we're going to get into it here in a minute. But I just want to share it with you. I was born with a mom and, to a mom and dad who did not love one another. I'm Italian. And my mom, when she was six months old, was engaged to my dad, who was a year old. Italian families, that's what they used to do. They used to say, you're going to marry my kid, you're going to marry. And that's what happened. My mom and dad never loved one another, had four kids. When my youngest brother was, was born, my dad left. I was two years old. My dad took off, and he left. I never saw him again until I was 10 years old. And I'm telling you, something was missing in my life. It must have been, Pastor, what was missing in my life. It must have been my dad not being around. That must have been what it was. And then I go to junior high school. I started playing ball. I remember the first time making my little league baseball team. And I made it. I was so happy. And the coach said, tomorrow's practice. Every one of you are to bring two baseballs, two brand new baseballs to practice. We were so poor, my mom couldn't afford two baseballs. I wasn't about to ask my mom for two baseballs. I knew she couldn't afford it. So I did what some little kids shouldn't have done. I went to G.C. Murphy's and I stole two baseballs. And I got caught. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I go home after I get caught. I meet a man I hadn't seen since I was two years old, a man called my dad. He heard I got, I stole baseballs, and he came in. My mom wasn't there, and he beat me with a miner's belt, just literally beat me with a miner's belt. And I thought, you know, when I get older, I can tell you, I'll get even with him. I'll find him. Something was missing in my life. It had to be that dad. had to be that dad that came to my house and beat me. That had to be what I was missing. had to be. Then I go to high school. And, boy, I started playing ball. God blessed me being a good athlete, and, and I was playing all kinds of ball, but I started getting in trouble. I started doing things. When, when sports was going on, everything was great. But when sports ended, I was getting in trouble. And I got in some trouble that I eventually had to go to court, and they sentenced me to a place called Pruntytown, a juvenile detention center. I was sentenced. I can still remember the judge said, you're sentenced to the age of 21 to West Virginia Industrial School for Boys unless further released. And I went, and I was there a year and a half. And I met a man. I met a man because they had a sports team there, too, and I played football for a man that not only is a professional athlete, was a professional athlete, but he's in the Hall of Fame in football. Frank Gunner Gatsky played for the Cleveland Browns. He was like an idol to me, a football player, a professional football player that I got to play for, that I loved, that I honored. And, 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 and he was so great to me that I thought, that must be what I've been missing. I've been missing somebody to look up to as a role model, a football player. That's what I thought. So then I leave praying down, go back to high school. I remember when I went to my high school, teachers told the kids in high school, don't go around with that kid. He's no good. He'll never amount to anything. Don't ever hang around with James on. I went by a nickname, Rat, back then. They said, dude. Oh, you knew me back then, huh? Okay. Okay. A guy named Rat. And they said, don't hang around with him. Don't go around that guy. He's no good. He's no That's all I ever heard. And I had one teacher that literally had one thing she wanted to see happen in her life. She wanted to see me in an electric chair, and she pulled the cord. <laughs> That's exactly what she did not like me. And so I said something to her and got kicked out of school. And I remember when I was supposed to go back to school, my football coach showed up, wanted me to, to come back to school. I said, no, I'll never come back to school. I never. And then that Gatsky, that professional football player, knocked at my door. He didn't say, You're do you want to go back to school? He said, get dressed. Well, I respected him. I got dressed. He took me back to school. He says, put him in school. If he gives you any more trouble, call me. But then I went to college, and I started 
I was an athlete there too, and, 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 but I started getting involved with drugs and getting involved with alcohol, and things just weren't. Something was missing in my life. It must have been that dad. It must have been that football coach. It must have been the drugs. It must have, something was missing. What was it? And then I go to college, and all, just all the trouble I got into. And then when I left college, I married my high school sweetheart. Boy, she was a pretty thing. I married, still is. <laughs> Pam, sorry, sorry, Pam, if you're watching this. You know, and, and I married her, but I wanted the things of the world. Our first six years of marriage was so terrible. It was literally terrible for her, not for me. It was terrible, and something was missing in my life. It must have been the fact I wasn't ready to get married, or it must have been the fact my dad beat me, or it must have been the fact I didn't have a role model. Something was missing in my life. And then all of a sudden, I'm playing softball on a softball team. We lost the championship game, and we got in a fight with the team to beat us, and I got arrested for felonious assault. I walked into my house, and my wife said, that's it. I want a divorce. I can't handle this anymore. My four-year-old son at the time, I had two kids. He was four years old at the time, come walking up to me. He says, Daddy, Daddy, are you drunk today? Are you drunk? He had no idea what it meant to be drunk today, but he heard my wife and I fight so much about alcohol. Daddy, Daddy, are you drunk today? So we planned to get her. She left the house, put our house up for sale. She found a trailer. And she picked out the collar scheme and everything, and that's what she was going to do. I had a brother that was a minister. He always invited me to church. He wasn't pastoring at the time, but he always invited me to church. I always turned him down, always turned him down, always turned him down. But it came to the point that losing my wife, going to court, felonious assault, you know, everything that I worked for, my kids, I don't know what's going to happen to them. Something's missing in my life. So I thought it has to be church. So I went to church, went to the Assembly of God Church in Fairmont, West Virginia. I still remember walking in and hearing the worship. It just captivated me. It was unbelievable. I honestly thought I was in a choir. The cho it was just so good. I don't remember what the preacher preached on, but I remember he gave an altar call. And I remember I thought, that's what I need. I need something like that. The only problem, it was the first Sunday in December, and on three Sundays from there, I was supposed to go to a fraternity Christmas party. I couldn't miss that fraternity Christmas party, so I didn't respond to that altar call. But I went back to church the next Sunday. My wife and I didn't even talk to one another. And we, she goes with me. We go back to church. I still remember the worship. I still remember the preacher. And I remember he gave an altar call. But I had that fraternity party I had to go to. I couldn't respond, not yet. I'll get saved after the fraternity party. So didn't go, but went back to church the next Sunday, a few days before my fraternity party. I remember the worship. I remember the altar call, and I remember my wife and I both responding, giving Jesus Christ, asking Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of our life. And I want to tell you something, church. Listen to this. It wasn't, should I go to church on Wednesday? Should I go on Sunday night? I want to go on Wednesday. I want to go on Sunday. I want to be in church every time the doors open. So I got saved. And listen, six months later, Father's Day, that four-year-old son that walked up to me and said, Daddy, are you drunk today? Stood up on a piano stool for a Father's Day, and he sang this song, Something's Happened to Daddy. He's not the same anymore. Things are different in our house like never before. Mommy said he met Jesus, and he washed him as white as snow. Something happened to Daddy. I know. I'll never forget that. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow. And let me say something. After I got saved, I never sinned again. Never had a problem again. You believe that? No. You're right. <laughs> You're right. There were things I did wrong after that. But why is it, church, why is it, that we can accept Jesus Christ for the first time and ask him to forgive us, but after we get saved, we have a hard time accepting his forgiveness again. Why is why does that happen to us? Why is that? You know, let me tell you why. It's because we end up elevating ourselves higher than God. There are people who say, I, I know God forgave me, but I can't forgive myself. Well, when you say that, God's here and you're here. How many believes God forgives you? If you truly repent, if you say, and I do too, and God came in, and he washed me as white as snow. And then let me tell you the grace of God in one's life, the grace of God. I, I served on the school board for 33 years in my county, okay? And this is what happened. My mom passed away in Arizona, and my brother sent me all the scrapbooks she had kept to me of all the sports I had done. And listen, she sent me the scrapbooks of all the trouble I got into. Ooh. You know, they were pretty big. But I was going through them and reading them, thanking God I wasn't that person anymore. But there were four letters in that scrapbook 
that really ministered to me. A letter on this page, a letter on this page, flip it over, letter here, letter here. First letter was 1968, written to my mother. Dear Mrs. Saunders, your son James Rath Saunders is expelled from Fairmont Senior High School and must find another high school to attend. Sign E.W. Malcolm, principal of Fairmont Senior. Say E.W. Malcolm. The second letter, 1968. Dear Mrs. Saunders, your son James Rath Saunders is expelled from the county and must find another county to attend. Signed, J.J. Strait, uh, superintendent of Marion County Schools. Turn it over to the third page, 1982. Dear Reverend Saunders, congratulations to be elected to the school board. We look forward to working with you in many years to come, but let me show you the grace of God. The fourth letter, Dear Reverend Saunders, we'd like for you to be the guest speaker of the retirement dinner of E.W. Malcolm, principal of Fairmont Senior High School. <laughs> Only the grace of God can take you from where you were to where you are today if you receive the grace of God. God can do those marvelous things. In my, I believe in every person. I believe in every young kid. I believe in, in every person. When, when I became a youth pastor, I went to the judges, three judges in our hometown. I said, listen, you know the trouble I got into all my life? You're going to find a kid that's in trouble. They need somebody. Call me. And the judges started calling me. Started calling me on the phone and saying, hey, you have this kid, you have this kid. And I'd work with them. I'd go back to my youth group and I'd tell the kids, hey, invite that girl to church. Invite that guy to church. And we saw kids coming to our youth group, getting saved and everything. Then one day, Judge Merrifield called me and said, hey, pastor, would you come? I got a girl that really needs your help. He said, let me explain something about her. First of all, she's 14 years old and she has been passed from family member to family member. She's right now in a juvenile detention center. Her mom is a Fairmont Street prostitute. Her dad is in prison. He killed a 16-year-old girl, but this girl needs help. i never forget walking into that courtroom. I walked in. I saw that girl. She was there. I mean, she was hard-looking in many ways, but you could tell she was a beautiful girl. Her mom was there. Her mom had a skirt on. It was up to here and a blouse that covered nothing. I said, God, don't give. Don't let the judge give this girl to her mom, and he didn't. He gave her to her great aunt and her, and her great uncle, and that's who she lived with. And then I tried, you know, I, I didn't, I never used the court system or the school system to shove Christianity down anyone's throat. But what I did do is have kids invite her to church. And she came. I remember the first Wednesday she came. If you look back to the left, all of you, that's where all the bad kids sit, you know, in every church, you know, in, in, the, far, in the far back left. And that's where she sat. She sat back there with kids, and she heard, you know, she didn't respond to the altar call, but she heard an announcement. We gave an announcement that said this. On Sunday or on uh, Saturday night, we're going to go around to our schools and pray for all our schools. We'll get in our bus and we'll pray. Well, the only kids that come to prayer meeting are kids that are serious. But this girl came. I mean, she came. We had about 90 kids that showed up. We got on our buses, and we drove around to all the schools. When we went to Fairmont State College and got out, formed a big circle, prayed, felt the Spirit say, give an altar call. I gave an altar call, and that little girl and three others gave her life to Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, you don't have to run around and say, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. You'll know you're saved by your actions. That little girl started bringing kids to church. She started bringing kids from all walks of life into the church youth group, into the youth group. And then three months later, I pick up this paper. I pick up this very paper with her picture on the first page. Who was Fame Cooper? She was kidnapped. She was taken to a mine. She was killed. And she had her head decapitated. And the article says, who was Fame Cooper? Was she the 14-year-old girl who dreamed of being a model? Was she a drug addict? Was she an alcoholic? Was she a devil worshiper? The article says, yes, she was probably all of those. But she changed. And they found, this article says the whole, tells the whole thing. They found around her little wrist one of those little black purses, you know, that, little, that women carry with just the cosmetics in it. And they opened it up. The sheriff, when he got there, opened it up. And there were some cosmetics in there, a, 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 a sunglasses, and a letter that had never been mailed. It was addressed to Pastor Rath Saunders, me. Sheriff had to bring the letter to my office because they couldn't open it, and I opened it, and here's what it said. Dear Pastor, dear Pastor, pray for my mom, pray for my dad, pray for my sister, pray for my brother, and thank you, Pastor, for leading me to Jesus. Well, my good friend Dave Reaver, I don't know if you know him. He's blown up in Vietnam. He speaks all over the world. He takes this article, and he has Fame Cooper Nights, and he goes around to many of his nights, and, and he has Fame Cooper, and he says this. And I love what he says. 
He says he believes that Fame Cooper's in heaven today alongside John the Baptist, who also was beheaded, as they worship the Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, because of her testimony of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, they never did find who killed her. It was on Unsolved Mysteries, and I did the funeral, one of the largest funerals in Fairmont. Her mom sat in the front row of that funeral and was a heckler. Every time I mentioned Jesus Christ, she said something nasty. I just went on and preached and shared. Then the funeral gave an altar call, and many kids gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Well, I want to say something to every one of you. Maybe the person you know, her mom's not a prostitute. Maybe the person you know, her dad's not a murderer. Maybe she hasn't been passed, but there are a lot of famed Coopers around this town that need to know about a Jesus Christ that loves you, that loves them, and cares for them. And unless we share the gospel with them, unless we share the gospel, and the reason why I share the gospel like I do is I heard a scripture when I first got saved, and it must be powerful because God put it in there twice. Ezekiel 3, 18 and 19, and Ezekiel 33, 8 and 9 says the same thing. Paraphrase it, it says this, if you know somebody that's unsaved, and you do not share the gospel with that person, and they die in their sin, their blood is recorded upon your hands. But if you know somebody and you share the gospel and they reject it, but at least you share it, their blood is not required upon your hands. I never want to get to heaven and have Jesus look at me and say, her blood is upon your hands. How many of you know somebody needs Jesus Christ? Just, I want to pray with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person that we are thinking about right now. I pray that, Lord, you give us the courage to stand up, the courage to speak, the courage to invite them to church, the courage to let them know that it's a Jesus that loves them and a Jesus that cares for them. I pray, oh God, that that would take place, whether it's, a instant, whether it's a family member, a friend, a co-worker, whomever it may be, that we'll have the courage to let them know that there's God that loves them. In Christ's name we say, amen. amen. I believe by faith. If you reach out to them, you can see them. And you may not lead them to the Lord. You know, you may not, but they could come to church and hear. They could come to church and hear about tithing and get saved. They can come to church and listen to the worship and let the Holy Spirit just minister in their hearts and their lives. I believe that because it happened to me, and it can happen to anybody. Turn your Bibles. First of all, hold your Bible up. Hold your Bible up. I always do this before I preach. And repeat after me. Hold your Bibles up. When a child of God... Repeat after me. When a child of God looks into the Word of God, he sees the Son of God. And he's changed. Changed by the Spirit of God into the image of God for the glory of God. Here it is. Change me, O oh God. Change me. I didn't come to see God challenge you. I came to see God change us. Amen? Turn your Bible to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Verse 16, Isaiah 43, verse 16. This is God speaking. He speaks it to us today. If you have it, say amen. amen. Okay? Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty men. They will lie down together and not rise again. They have been quenched and extinguished like a wick. Now watch this. Do not call to mind the former things. Do not ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not understand it? Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the desert. I will even make a roadway in the desert. God says this, I want to do something new. In who? In who? In you. Say that. God wants to do something new in me. Say it. <laughs> Look at somebody beside you. Say, God wants to do something new in you. Tower, tower, tower. God wants to do something new. But then here's what it says. Will you not understand it? Some of your Bibles say, will you not perceive it? Can you not understand what he wants to do? Why is it that we, want, we know God wants to do something new in us, but we don't understand it? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you three reasons. Why I believe people can't understand that God wants to do something new. Can't understand when God's trying to speak to you to do something new. First reason is this. We can't get past our past sins. 
Hear me, we can't get past our past sins. How many in this room has ever sinned? Only you haven't. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was kidding you, honey. I was just kidding you. We all have sinned. But let me tell you, the devil has a heyday with God's people because of our sins. I love what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The emphasis of that scripture is not on your sin. You know, we use it all the time for salvation, but it's not on your sin. The emphasis of that scripture is God's favor. You know, if we confess our sins, that's all it says about sins. Then it says, he is faithful, he is just, he is righteous. He will forgive us of all our unrighteousness. He is the one that forgives us. You know, Chuck Swindoll, I love, I love his writing. Even though I used to get mad at him because he was non-Pentecostal and he used to bust on the Pentecostal. I mean, he really did until his brother, a pastor, got saved and he apologized. I mean, not only got not saved, I'm sorry, to his brother, a pastor, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then Chuck wrote a book and he said, I apologize that I've even felt this way. But he says something in one of his books that I love. He, he says, the forgiving process is never complete to it's forgotten. The forgiving process is never complete to it's forgotten. You know, the devil has a heyday of whispering in our ear and reminding us of the things we've done wrong. Hey, Nelson, hey, Nelson, you're getting up there and you're going to take up the offering, but remember last night? You were a glutton. You know, yeah. what are you laughing at? You know, remember three days ago? Remember what happened? Bob Lewis, remember what you did, Bob Lewis. He has a tendency to whisper in our ear, no matter who we are, Linda, <laughs> Linda. You know, you, you ever notice that? I'm going to illustrate that for you, okay? I, I'm going to illustrate it for you. you imagine a, a mom and dad taking, taking their children to grandma and grandpa's house. You know, I don't know about you. When I was a little kid, I loved to go to grandma's house. You know why? Because she cooked spaghetti. Oh, man. She could really cook spaghetti and homemade bread. I mean, she, on Sundays, we every Sunday, that was where we wanted to go. Well, listen, I want you to imagine taking your little boy and your little girl. Your little girl goes in the kitchen with mama to cook, but not that little boy. That little boy's going with grandpa, going to do something, play ball. Or what, and here's, gra here, here's this little boy. Come here, come here, come here. Here's this little boy. Come here, quick, 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 quick. Here's this young man. I'm grandpa, and I say to him, we're going out in the woods. I bought you a slingshot. Here, take the slingshot. I want you to be as good as David in the Bible with that slingshot. Can you? Yeah, I can be as good as David. <laughs> so we're walking through the woods, and we stop. And I see a tree. I said, pick up a rock. Pick up a rock. Put it in the slingshot and hit that tree. He fires. He misses. So Grandpa leaves, and he says, I'm still going to be good. He walks, but he's a smart little kid. He sees a bigger tree, picks up a bigger rock, puts it in that slingshot, Let's it go, and he misses. But he's such a smart little kid. He walks closer and sees a big tree, picks up a bigger rock, puts it in a slingshot, lets it go, and he misses. But he's such a smart kid, he sees a barn. He picks up a rock. He says, I'll just hit the side of that barn. He lets it go, and he goes clear over the barn. So with his head down, he's walking back, disappointed. <laughs> Got to tell Grandpa, I'm not very good at this. On the way back, he looks, and he looks in the pond. And he sees grandma, Grandma's prize duck. He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to scare that duck. He reaches in, picks up a rock, puts it in the slingshot, lets it go, hits that duck right in the neck. The duck falls over dead. I mean, he looks around. He looks around. He sees nobody but his little sister. He sees his little sister. He doesn't care about her. He runs, gets the duck, picks it up, puts it under a bunch of leaves, and he starts walking back to the house with his chest up, singing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And, and then he goes in. And that night, they're sitting around the dinner table. And Grandma, Grandma says, his name's Johnny. says, Johnny, I want you to help with the dishes tonight. Johnny says, no, I don't want to help with the dishes. What do you mean you don't want to help with the dishes? My sister wants to help with the dishes. His sister looks at him and whispers his ear, Remember the duck. He gets up and he helps with the dishes. He says, I'm going to work with these dishes. I mean, and then that evening, Grandpa says, hey, Johnny, I'm taking you hunting tomorrow. The little sister, I want to go. I want to go. You're not going hunting. You're a girl. She whispers in his ear, remember the duck. He says, okay, you can go hunting tomorrow. The next day they go hunting. Grandpa says, go start a fire. Grandpa, I don't want to start a fire. I don't want to start a fire. Let my sister start the fire. She looks at him. What does she say? Duh. He couldn't take it any longer. 
Johnny thought, this is horrible. He goes back to Grandma. He says, Grandma, Grandma, I got something I want to tell you. She goes, stop, Johnny. Are you going to tell me about my duck that you killed? He said, Grandma, how'd you know? I was looking out the kitchen window. Listen to me. I was just wondering how long you would allow your sister to make a slave of you. That's exactly what the devil does. He makes a slave because he reminds us of a, remember, remember when you sinned? Remember last night when you sinned? Okay, okay. Yeah, remember? Yeah. He whispers, you're in church. Remember what you did? Who you think you are worshiping God? He whispers in her ear. He looks over there and he says, I saw you last night. I saw you, champ. You know? And he whispers and he makes a slave out of us. You want to understand what God wants to do in your life? He wants to, how many wants God to do something new in their life? Man, I do. Get past your past sins. Don't let the devil beat you up with your past sins. Second thing that I believe holds us back is we have to face our past scars. Listen to me carefully. I'm not saying this for a pity party. Some of you parents in here may want to explain it to your kids later, but I'm going to tell you about past scars. When I was in the sixth grade, my mother brought a man into our house. He came into my bedroom that evening, and he sexually abused me. And I hid that. I hid that. Never told it. Never told my mom. Never told my brother. Never told my sisters. Never told my best friend. I hid it of shame, but I hid it behind my humor and my sports. I thought someday I'll find that guy. Someday I'll find that guy. I was so ashamed of what had happened to me. Nothing I could have done. And then later on, I give my life to Jesus Christ. And when I give my life to Jesus Christ, I, I, I never shared it with anybody. My mother, I never shared. And I never shared this story with anybody until after my mother died. I never wanted her to hear about it. But I was in Kansas City, Missouri, doing a school assembly. And it was, just, it was a school assembly about patriotism. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, tell those kids about your abuse. My abuse? And it's the first time I ever spoke it. And I shared what I just shared with you in a little more detail. And, that, and I left there to go to another school. And the principal of that school in Baxter Springs, Kansas, called. And he said, told the youth pastor, would you bring that man back? We have over 30 kids in our office who the same thing has happened to them. They want to talk to somebody. So the reason why I share it is not so you feel sorry for me, just to let you know I had to get past that. If I'd allowed that sin to continue rooting within me, it had destroyed me. I never would have allowed God to work on my life like he has. And there are things in our lives that we have to get past those past scars. I'll prove it to you in Scripture how it worked for you. Turn to Genesis 41. Let me show you something. It's an incredible story. Sometimes we, Pastor and I talked about this this morning. Sometimes many people just bypass the Bible and they pick up things they want to read. This is one of those Scriptures that many people miss what God's trying to say. God's always teaching us something. If we really understand it, He's always teaching us something. This is an incredible story. Before I read the scripture, I'll set the scene for you, which many of you already know. Joseph, you know, Joseph and his 11 brothers. You know, Joseph was a great, you know, son, but, but for some reason, dad made him a coat. He made him a coat that was nicer than anyone else. And I could see Joseph. He probably did what Pastor Bob would have done, put his coat on, say, look at me. Look at me. Look at this coat. You don't have a coat like this. What are you laughing at, Tom? You don't have a coat like this. You know, look at my coat. Look at, my, look, look at this coat. You don't have a coat like this. Your brother doesn't have a coat like this, you know. And he's running around, bragging. Well, you know, so then the brothers go off to tend the sheep, to tend the flock. And dad sends Joseph. He says, Joseph, I want you to go out and feed him. Here comes Joseph. And the brothers see him coming. There's that no good for nothing tattletale. There's that guy that brags and says, we're going to bow to him someday. Let's throw him in a pit. Let's sell him. They didn't want to kill them. Let's sell them. And that's what they did. They throw them in a pit. They eat their food. Some people come by. They sell them. And he goes to Egypt. And Joseph, I love what the Bible says, though, and God was with him. And God was with him. And God was with him. And God, but to something amazing, it was over 14 years before he ever saw his brothers again. Over 14 years before he ever ran into those brothers again. Look what happened. Before the famine comes, Genesis 41, verse 50. Now, before the year of famine. Now, what's that mean? A year before the famine came. You got it? A year before the famine came. Say one year. One year before the famine came. 
Two sons are born to Joseph. In Bible days, they named their kids. That meant something. Okay, verse 51. Joseph named the firstborn born Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble. Verse 52. He named the second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in this land. Look, a year before he ever saw his brothers, he names his first son saying, I have forgiven, I have forgotten all that's been done to me. And then because he forgot, God gives him fruit in his life. I believe there's a lot of us that aren't running around with the fruit that God has in store for us because we're not forgiven. You know, forgiveness always precedes fruitfulness. And I'm telling you something, church, we have to get past those past scars, no matter what's been said about you. No matter, if I would have carried on those teachers that went, when I went back to high school after the reform school and said, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never be any good. You'll never, you're going to be in prison. You're going to do that. If I'd allowed that to happen, I, that might have been what happened to me. But I had to get past those scars, past those evil sayings, past those things that took place, or I never would understand what God wanted to do in my life. So two things I've mentioned. For God to work in your life, for you to understand that God wants to do a new thing, number one, you have to get past your past sins. Number two, you have to get past your past scars, the things that have been people said about you, done about you, or whatever. And number three, you have to get past your past successes. Philippians chapter 3. Look at it. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. I love this scripture. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I laid hold of by Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, excuse me. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing. Say one thing. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Now, doesn't that sound like a little oxymoron? One thing I do, and he gives two things. Forgetting and? No, what he's saying, there's only one thing. It's one complete step. I forget and I press on. I forget and I press on. We have to forget our past successes. If you came to my hometown, you'd probably see a guy wearing a, a 1967 polar bear uh, uh, letterman's jacket. You know, I mean, 1967, he wore 60, yeah, 67. He, he, he got a jacket. He played in one play in four years, and he recovered a fumble. And if you met him on the street today with that jacket on, he'd say, I got to tell you about this fumble I recovered. I got, because he's living on the past. Too many people live in the past of what God has done. I'm thankful what God did to me in the past. I'm thankful I can share my testimony where God brought me from. But I don't want to live in the past. I want God to do something new in my life. I want God to pour his blessings upon me. I want God to do something so great in my life that I, I just want to press on. I'm not looking for a new revelation from God. God's given me his word. I want him to pour out. When I'm sick, I want him to give me a healing. When somebody's, when my family member is unsaved, I want to see him saved. When, when somebody out there, wouldn't, when I want a job and somebody's going to lie to me, I want to be able to stand up and say, no, you're lying to me. You know, I want God to do a new thing in my life. New thing in worship, new thing in the word. You know, I want to pray for my pastor like I never prayed for him before. I want to pray for my pastor and his wife and ask every time he steps in the pulpit that the anointing of God will pour upon his life. Don't raise your hand, but let me question you. How many of you prayed for your pastor this week? Don't raise your hand. I'm not doing it for a pat on I'm just saying a lot of times we neglect that. You ought to have in front of your Bible. If you look in the front of my Bible, there's a page in there, and it's a page of prayer requests. When somebody asks me to pray, I write it down. I write it down. You ought to have a page request, and one of the first things you put up there is pastor, pastor's family, and pray. Because I want to tell you, the devil would love to destroy your pastor. Amen? He'd love to destroy your pastor. So if you want to understand what God wants to do in your life, get past your past sins. Get past your past scars. Get past your past successes and ask God to do something new. Here's what I hear a lot of people say. I'm not worthy to have God do something to me. I hear people, Christians say, I'm not worthy to have God do I, I, you know, I'm not worthy to have God do something to me. Give it, let God do it to somebody. I'm not worthy to have something. Well, uh, true story. True story. I read this in a, in a 
airplane one day. A guy who loved yard sales, garage sales. It's not me. A guy who really loved it used to go around to all garage sales and yard sales. Just go to all of them. One day he showed up to a garage sale and out in the driveway were all these things. And he looked around, nothing interested him. And he looked in the garage and he saw something wrapped up with an old tarp. And he asked the lady, he said, man, what's that? Piece of junk. She said, my husband, before he died, bought that thing. And she said, it's a piece of junk. He said, can I see it? Took the tarp off of it, and it was an old, rusty, beat-up Harley Davidson motorcycle. Just beat up. And he said, man, I love tinkering with things like that. I like to have it. She said, I tell you, you give me $100, and you take that out of here. I want it out of here anyway. So he gave her $100, put that old, I mean, it wouldn't run or start, put it in the back of his truck, and he took it home. In a couple months, he just started tinkering with it and working with it and everything, and he needed a part for it. And he called the Harley Davidson shop. He said, listen, do you have, and he named a part. And the guy said, well, I'm not sure which one you need. He said, listen, give me the serial number of the bike, and I'll be able to tell you if we have it. He said, serial number? He said, yeah, on the back fender in the inside, if you go in there, the serial number will be there. So he went, and the inside of the fender, he looked. It was all rusty, and he had to scrape it off. And he wrote down the number, and he called the Harley Davidson shop back, and he said, here's the number. And the guy said, well, hold on. And he waited a while, and he came back, and the guy said, are you sure that's the number? He said, well, yeah, that's what I got. He said, well, listen, the serial number is also under the seat. Under the seat, there'll be a serial number. Go back and see. He goes back, once again, rusty, he takes it off, gets the same number that he had, and he goes back and said, no, it's the same number. And the guy said, listen, go back. Is there any writing under that serial number? And the guy goes back. And he comes back, he gives the writing to the guy, and the guy says, hold on a minute. Huh. Hold on a minute. 20 minutes later, he's still on hold. He thought, oh, dear God, this bike's stolen. Now they're coming to get me. That's what he thought. He goes back. The guy came back and said, listen, my boss told me to offer you $50,000 for that bike. Fifty thousand. He realized he had a gym. He didn't know what it was, but he realized he had a gym. So he said, no, I'm going to keep it. True story. Two months later, Jay Leno called him, offered him $100,000 for the bike. He never sold it. Let me tell you, the bike was not valuable in itself. But under the seat, under the serial number, in quotations, was this, the king. You see, the bike was owned by Elvis Presley. The bike had no value in itself, but because who owned it, it was valuable. Well, look at me. Take your finger like this and point to yourself. You may not feel you're valuable, but I can promise you, you're owned by the king. You're owned by the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And you are valuable because the king of kings and the Lord of lords looks at you and says you're valuable. And I believe that with everything in me. You're valuable. You're valuable. Everyone in this room, every one of these young kids are valuable. Not in themselves, but because we're owned by the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Church, it's beautiful coming to the presence of God. It's beautiful, understand. But listen to me again. You want God to do a new thing? Get past your past sins. Don't let the devil browbeat you with your sin. Don't let him remind you of what you've done. Remind him that it's under the blood. We talked about that this morning. It's under, in your prayer this morning. You, you shared that under the blood, under the blood. And get past your past scars, the things that have happened to you. And I know in this room, there's some of you that you've been reminded of those past scars. Don't be browbeat by them. And forget the past successes. Thank God for the successes, but let God do a new thing in your life because you're valuable. Join me in prayer. Father, you're awesome. There is no one like you, oh God. There's no one that can do for us what you can do. There's no one that can forgive us like you can forgive us. There's no one that can anoint us like you can anoint us. There's no one that can touch us like you can touch us. There's no one that can take the scars in our life and replace them with the love and the mercy from you. There's nobody like you, oh God. And I pray in this very place this morning that, God, you will heal. The Holy Spirit will go through this room and heal broken hearts, heal people of things that have been done in the past that, that, that has been brought up again, that will touch them in the name of Jesus, never to be brought up again. And as the Holy Spirit takes his iron and irons out the wrinkles in our lives, the things and then you can begin doing the new things in their lives oh God like only you can with everyone praying in this room I don't know you but 
I wouldn't dare leave here without giving somebody an opportunity to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I've been away from you, and I want to begin a new start with you this morning. I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to ask you to be my Lord, my Savior. Everyone in this room, pray this prayer out loud with me. Heavenly Father, I'm in need of a Savior. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I want a new start. I believe in you. I accept you. I receive you. And I know that you'll work on my life. Now pray, everyone in this room. If you just pray to you for the first time, inviting Jesus to your life, or you have truly been away from him, and you want to say this morning, I'm starting with him working on my life. Just those people, look me in the eyes. That's me this morning. I want Jesus Christ to come into my life. You believe that, honey? I, I believe what you You believe that, sir? You looking at me? Beautiful. Anyone else? You looking at me, pal? Saying, I want Jesus to forgive me. I've done some things that are wrong, but this morning I'm starting new. That's our God. That's our Savior. That's how He works. That's how He works. And God is doing a marvelous work. God is doing a marvelous work. Receive that forgiveness. Receive that healing. Receive that touch that only comes from your Father above that loves you so much. Loves you so much. Now the rest of you as you're praying, let me ask you a question. Are you here today and God has been reminding you of past sins and constantly beating you up with what you've done? Or he's the scars that have been done to you, you've been hampered by it and beaten up by it. You're beating yourself up by it or the devil's beating you up with it. Or you're living on past successes. You say, God, I want those things ended so you can do a new thing. Just those people, look me in the eyes. That's me. That's me. I need to get by. That's beautiful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, honey. Thank you, honey. Thank you, ma'am. Sir. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am. Thank you, sir. Young man, beautiful. Beautiful. That's how our God works. Don't let the enemy steal what he's, God has done for you right now. You've asked him to take care of those scars, those things people have said about you, those things that have hampered you. You get by it now. It's over. It's under the blood of Jesus. God's going to work in your life like you've never seen before. You're going to leave here today, and, and sitting on the hood of your car is going to be the devil saying, it won't work. It won't work. He's a liar. He's a liar. He's a liar, a father of lies. But God says to you, you're valuable. You're mine. And that's the most beautiful thing in all the world. Let's stand. Let's stand together. Grab somebody's hand across the aisle. Just grab someone's hand across the aisle. Now I want you to pray a prayer for that person. Forget your need right now and pray. And pray that the Holy Spirit would instill within them right now what God has done for them and that the Holy Spirit would constantly remind them that, that, that the devil's a liar and all the lying and whispering is wrong. Pray for him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, thank you, my sister. 